Shouldn't we find comfort and uh, encouragement in the, in the assembly together? And we, we, we certainly should. Uh, the scripture says that we shouldn't forsake the assembling together. Uh, and all the more when we see the day approaching of the return of the Lord Jesus. His return is most certain. And it is uh, impending. When will, shall the Lord return? No one knows. No one even knows the day or the hour. And so therefore, we have confidence that we await for His return. And His return shall mean the righting of much wrong. Most of our experience upon the earth is uh, dwelling amongst the much wrong. And how terribly disturbing and awful it is to dwell amongst that which is wrong and off. Romans chapter 8 says that the whole creation is groaning. Groaning, awaiting the redemption and the revelation of the children of God. And so as we wait, we find comfort together. And that's why coming to church is so wonderful. Thank God for the ability to have online services. Because what would have happened to our churches during the last two years ago for two years? What would have happened for, to the people of God without the ability for technology to to bring the worship to people's homes. Um, and thank God for it, even for our invalids and, and persons who are sick today. Um, with that said, it is an encouragement to be with you and to be together, to hear your voices and uh, to sing and to pray. I'd like to, uh, to offer a prayer for those of you who are sick and many of you are at home and suffering, have been sick and are still sick. Um, the church very kindly prayed for me last Wednesday night, and I've never been sick before. I've never really been sick and for any period of time. And so when the church, the Bible says, the Bible says, if any of you are sick, and I don't mean you stumped your toe, if any of you are really sick, call the elders of the church together, and they will anoint you with oil, and they will pray for you, and the healing or the prayer of the elders will bring healing. And uh, you say, Pastor, are you healed? I don't feel healed. I feel encouraged. I feel encouraged. I don't feel healed. And that's okay because there are many champions of faith in the Bible that suffered physical problems. And the Apostle Paul had some physical problem. And he asked the Lord three times to take it away from him. And the Lord says, my grace is sufficient for you. And so therefore, I don't necessarily have to feel healed if I feel encouraged. And this gospel is the encouragement of hope eternal and uh, strength for this present existence. Thank you for your care and love for me. And with that in mind, I thought it would be good for us to pause and remember that not everybody was there on Wednesday getting prayed for. Some people were at home sick. And uh, we've got time. Let's take a couple of minutes and pray. You know the names. You know people I don't know. Take some time and pray for them, will you? Quietly then we pray. Our Father, we remember the persons in our lives that are hurting and sad and lonely and sick. And some of them... Um, are trying to chart a course forward and some of them are just trying to stand in the midst of pain and sickness and disease. Some are, many of them are at home and maybe watching on, on television. And many of them are here and they, they found a way to get here. I pray for your strength for every pain, every hurt. And may that pain not go to waste. May it make us humble and loving and caring for our neighbors. And uh, and more trusting in you. Almighty God, may our suffering cause us to trust in you more. This would be the great benefit of it, so that the pain would not go to waste. Hear our prayers for each of the dear saints, our loved ones, our families that are in need of our prayers. In Jesus' name, amen. For such a time as this, our heroine in the story of Esther is Queen Esther. And what a girl she was, just a simple an uh, orphan girl who was taken into the palace in a roundabout way, in an unusual way, 
And God's provident workings in our lives are so unusual sometimes. And we turn around and say, my goodness, how did you ever think of that? My goodness, how did you ever think of that? I think of my friend J.L. Dillard. And J.L. Dillard, who was a, a community known throughout the community where I pastored in Raleigh as an atheist and just a hardened man. <clears throat> and J.L. Dillard was on his way to the World's Fair. I think it was a, maybe in the early 80s. And J.L. and his wife and his daughter were in the car. And uh, the car was, uh, was hit down a long run by, by a semi-trailer truck. Uh, killing his wife instantly. And J.L. was in the hospital for several months in a, in a coma. And my friend J.L.'s story is this story. When I woke up, I didn't know where I was. But someone told me that I was in the hospital and had been there for months in a coma. And I said, and J.L. said to the doctor, or the nurse, where is Nita? His wife's name was Nita. He said, uh, Mr. Dillard, uh, Nita's dead. She was killed in the accident. And so my friend woke up. Not only had he been in a coma for months, but his wife was dead. Now to any average human, that kind of uh, situation would make a person bitter and angry. And uh, in our human existence, it would make us angry. But for J.L., it was uh, the unusual workings of providence that opened his eyes to the gospel. So how could this be? How could this work? And J.L.'s uh, word to me or his testimony would be something like this. When I found out that my wife was dead, I said to God, how could you possibly take her instead of me? She was a devoted believer in Christ, and I was the atheist. She was loving and caring, and I was arrogant and greedy. She was wonderful, and I was crummy. Why take her instead of me? And the Holy Spirit said to Mr. Dillard, because she was ready, and I needed her here. You were not ready, and I need you there. J.L. was born again and became one of the strongest members of that church. And through the workings, the mysterious workings of providence, God brought him to a saving knowledge of himself. Why is it that we stand with clenched fists to the Creator God and say, you have no right or rule over me? And that's, that really is our problem, isn't it? The arrogance and stubbornness of our heart where we shake a a, a, a bound fist to God and say, you have no right over me. But the Creator does have right over His creation. We must ask ourselves, I think rightly, who is in charge? Who is in charge of this world? Who is in charge of our lives? Listen to some scripture. Daniel 4 and verse 17. Listen to the Word of God. And the Most High, this is our God, the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom He will and sets over it the lowliest of men. Who is this God of ours, the one with the right to rule, the one with authority to rule? The Most High rules over the kingdom of men and gives it to whom He will. And sets over it the lowest of men. God chooses. And this is God's world. It's His to choose. Let's think about our repeated definitions. I know that every week there are new people here. Or some people are out. And this is the nature of life. What is sovereignty? Let me redefine. Sovereignty. God's right to rule the earth that is His. He's sovereign. This is His world. He has a right to rule and reign over it. You say, well, I don't like it. I understand that you don't like it. This is the nature of the sin. The sin in us, we don't like it. Uh, the sinner never likes what God does or what, what is within the purview of God. 
Who's in charge? It is God. Psalms uh, 75, 6 and 7. For exultation comes neither from the east nor from the west nor from the south. But God is the judge. He puts down one and exalts the other. Whose earth is it? Whose world is this? It is God's. We are participants in it. And why are we here? To bring glory to Him. And why did He make us the way that He made us? To bring glory to Him. How sinful are we? The Bible says that the intentions and heart of the man are only evil continually. They say, well, I don't feel so sinful. I don't think I'm all that bad a person. In what way have you failed? In the most important way. In the way that God created you special and placed you unique upon the earth. And without you, there's no one like you. And therefore, to fail to be you, representing God in the world where he placed you, is the ultimate, the ultimate act of rebellion. Because there's no one else like you. You say, well, if I don't worship God, someone else will, but not like you. There won't be anybody else like you. And therefore, To reject, to worship God in you, your gifting, your voice, your eyes, your ears, your being, your your sphere of influence to fail to worship God is an ultimate rebellion. The exaltation comes neither from the east or the west, from the south, but God is the judge. He puts down one and exalts another. As you're living and exalting and glorifying God, it is God who promotes you and uh, God who positions you where you are. Where am I? Where you are is in your family, in your neighborhood, in your job place, in your church. You are where you are for a reason, specially, wonderfully made to glorify God. In what way are we sinful and so desperately needy in the way that we have failed to be the thing we were put on the earth to be. The image of God in human flesh, Christ living in us, so that everyone would say that's what it means. That's what it means to be human rightly. But we have failed, and the intentions of man's heart is only evil continually. How evil greed, selfishness, self-preservation, self-advancement. John 19, 11, and Jesus was talking to uh, those persons uh, arguing with him about the reality of faith, and you could have no power at all against me. He's talking to Pilate. No, it's it's at the time Pilate is about to sentence him. And you could have no power at all against me unless it had been given to you from above. Where does power come from? Does it come from the east or the west or the north or the south? No. Exultation comes neither from the east or the west or the north or the south, but God is the judge. And God gave power to Pilate to persecute Jesus. And for what purpose? So that our sins, that sin, what sin? That sin of you failing to bear rightly the image of God. That sin. You say, well, I'm guilty of a lot more than that. Well, so am I, and I'm glad you recognize that because I'm guilty of all the Ten Commandments in one way or another. Whether in deed or in thought, I'm guilty of all of them. And Jesus said, you'd have no power, Pilate. Pilate says, I could crucify you. And he says, "Eh, not really, but go ahead. Luke 14, 11, for whoever exalts himself will be humbled. And he who humbles himself will be exalted. You say, Pastor, I've been listening to you for months or weeks or whatever, and I'm thinking, what do I need to do to be saved? I would say, first of all, put yourself in a position where you can believe the gospel. And that position is of of lowliness. If you exalt yourself, I don't need it. I don't need a savior. I'm not so bad. Putting yourself in an exalted position brings the wrath of God because it is the very pinnacle of unbelief for us to say that we have no sin in us when God says, let let God be true and every man be a liar. Whosoever exalts himself will be humbled. He who humbles himself will be 
exalted. In what way does God do His way? Through the humble, the weak, and the meek. Have no humble humility, you shall have no greatness. And what is the mark of the greatest? The lowest. Be seated at the lowest table. Luke chapter 14, what a beautiful passage. Luke 14. And there's a party going on. And Jesus says, hey, tell them all to come on in to the party. And what a party. And then someone who's arrogant decides that they are at the party and they're seated in a, in a poor position. They're at the, one of the back tables. They're at the bottom position. And uh, they decide, if you go into a party, Jesus said, and you're seated at the lowest position, do not take for yourself the right to be put into the preeminent position. Because Jesus would then, Jesus said, because the host may come to you and say, Oh, you, you arrogant one. Oh, you, you arrogant one. Be seated lower. And then he may say to the humble one, be seated higher. And uh, for whoever exalts himself will be humbled. That's the context. 2 Corinthians 10, 18, believe it or not, was the first verse I memorized uh, as a new Christian. I was 21 years of age. And I'd come uh, to faith. Not, I didn't come to religion. I, did, I didn't come to, um, to make a decision or to sign up or to join or to be involved. No, I was dramatically converted by the Spirit of God. God awakened me. I didn't believe and I believed. I, 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 I rejected, but then I accepted. This was the miracle of the work of the gospel. So I would call on you today. Do not seek for a position in the kingdom. Seek for a place of humility with the Savior. And from that position, you're in a, you're in a place where you can be born again. Just say to God, I, I, what do I have to bring to you? You don't need anything I have. And therefore, I am a sinner. Have mercy upon me. He's a sinner. See the humility? Jesus says, humility like that shall be exalted. And here's the verse, my first one I memorized. I'm going to read it in the, uh, in the English Standard Version, then I'll quote it, I think, superiorly from the King James, my, my version of love, my heart language. 2 Corinthians 10, 18, For it is not the one who commends himself who is approved, but the one whom the Lord commends. Who is it that is promoted in the things and in the kingdom of God? Not the one who exalts himself, but the one who is humbled. So here it is in the King James Version. The one who commendeth himself is not commended, but the one whom the Lord commends. The one who commendeth himself is not commended. Unlike the things of the world, unlike the business world, unlike Hollywood, unlike the selfish uh, Matriculations of men, unlike any of that, the one promoted in the kingdom is the humble. The one who exalteth himself, commendeth himself, is not commended, but the one whom the Lord commends. We've been studying for weeks about Esther. We've been studying in Romans. What is God doing? God is providentially working out His plan upon the earth so that He gets maximum glory and His children get beautiful grace and mercy. And this is the whole story. What is my story? My story is the story of mercy, practically and providentially applied to my life. My story is the story of mercy, providentially applied to my daily life so that I could believe it. So I've never believed. Nobody believes until they believe. You say, well, I can't believe. You say, my loved ones can't believe. Nobody believes until they believe. And how do they believe? The one who is humble, the Lord exalts. The Lord reveals himself to those he, he, he wills to reveal himself. So this is a beautiful story here in Esther. And the Esther story is uh, really hinging. Chapter 4, verse 14 and it says, 
And who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. This is Mordecai's words to Esther in the situation she was in. What a terrible situation. Terrible situation. And God said to her, I made you for this. See how humility and confidence go together? She was humble and had to be because of the situation she was in. Humility and confidence go together in spiritual things. Aggression and confidence go together in worldly things. Aggression and confidence go together in worldly things. Humility and confidence go together in spiritual things. Because we believe that God exalts the humble and He humbles the exalted. This is very different from our natural inclinations as humans. We desire to exalt ourselves. No. Malcolm uh, Muggeridge, here's his quote. He's an author. He was a little bit like Will Rogers for England. Although uh, he was an author, speaker, part-time philosopher. Every happening, great and small, is a parable whereby God speaks to us and the art of life is to get the message. If we believe in providence, then we believe that God is at work in our lives to produce His glory and our good. And therefore, we ought very seriously contemplate the affairs of daily life and see them for what they are. Is this event something of importance? Is this a real thing that God wants to use in my life? I was, I was crying out last Sunday, let our pain not go to waste, oh God. And therefore we say this pain is for the purpose of making us patient and loving and humble. You got a choice. Hey, listen to me. You got a choice, really. Do you believe this world is in chaos or do you believe this world is ordered by the provident hand of God? Which is it? Is this world in chaos and is your daily experience up to the whims of the fates, as the Greeks would say, or the chaos, as the, as the current generation would say? Or is God actually causing the affairs of life to bring Him glory and our maturity through it? If it's chaotic, then join in and uh, do good luck. My confidence is that God, by His provident hand, is bringing about His glory and my good. And we see that all through the story of Esther. Chapter 1, verses 1 through 9, we see the party that sets the whole thing up. And for time's sake, I'd like to just kind of go over what is happening in the book of Esther. I think if the Lord will help me, we'll just be able to speed through the whole narrative and And finish for today, if the Lord allows. Party of the year. 180 days of partying. Chapter 1. They're having a feast. Ahasuerus, the Persian ruler, is leader over 127 provinces. It's from, from North Africa on the west all the way on the right to um, wherever that is, China, what we would call China now. It's Iran. The capital is in Iran, as we would say Iran is, and Susa down below. So there's a giant party, and he's invited all of his leaders. And there are 180 days of it. Wow. What a, what a, it was party of the year, no question. Then the banishment of Vashti, who was the, who was Ahasuerus' first wife. He invited her or commanded her to go and dance before the party goers. She says, no thanks, not in for that. And she is banished, very likely assassinated. And uh, we've talked about that. Thirdly, the selection of Queen Esther. Esther is Vashti's replacement. And how did she come onto the scene? How is it that God brought this person into the position to be used by him? providential hand of God. He's at work here. He has a beauty contest throughout the land. All the most beautiful women 
in, uh, in Persia are invited to come and some are selected to be in, in, the, in the beauty pageant to be selected for the new queen. And uh, so Vashti's done. Queen Esther is invited to be the queen, verses 16, 17. And then after that, we see Mordecai, who is Esther's uncle, I think, or at least cousin. Kind of, kind of hard to figure exactly his relation to her. I think cousin. But he has taken her to raise as uh, her folks have passed away. So Mordecai is raising Esther. And uh, she is stunningly beautiful. Her name in Hebrew is Hadassah, which means beautiful. And her uh, Persian name is Esther. She's kind of keeping the Jewish thing on the down low because being a Jew at this time wasn't necessarily a crime and it wasn't even a problem as long as you behaved. And, uh, but so Esther thought it best if she kept that on the down low and that's exactly what she did. Mordecai is her cousin. Mordecai is not a secret disciple. Mordecai is standing up for his faith, and he's not backing down at all. Parts of these ancient uh, people groups, they, were worship, they would worship idols, and they would worship people, and they were commanding that people would bow down and worship Haman, who was one of the king's officials, and of course, Mordecai would not. Chapter 5, verse 9, I'll just read that. Find it in your Bible if you don't mind. We'll, we'll, read, a, we'll read several verses here. 5 and 9, And Haman went out that day joyful and glad of heart. But when Haman saw Mordecai in the king's gate, that he neither rose nor trembled before him, he was filled with wrath against Mordecai. So Haman is a king's official. He's an evil man. He's the one who's going to be the antagonist in this story. And Esther, of course, is the hero. Mordecai is a supporting cast member uh, bringing about the, the news. The strong faith of Mordecai, he would not bow down. Let me, if you don't mind, turn to Exodus chapter 20. Exodus 20. And listen to why Mordecai would not bow down and worship when uh, it was customary to do so. And why Haman... The Persian um, officiant was requiring it. And of course, Ahasuerus, the king, required bowing. And Exodus chapter 20 reminds us how the Jew could not do that in, in good conscience. Uh, chapter 20, Exodus verse 3, You shall have no gods before me. You shall have no gods before me. And you shall uh, not make for yourselves a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or in the things in the earth beneath. And that is the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For the Lord your God is a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers unto the children to the third and fourth generation for all those who hate me. So the Bible is pretty clear. God is a jealous God. He shall take no lesser place he would not take a lesser place in the community of faith called the Jews, and he will not take lesser place in your own heart. How can you be born again, not with a competing affection? Did not Jesus say, you must love me more than father, mother, son, or daughter? Did he not? He did. Shall a man love God and love money? Impossible. Impossible. You shall have no competing affection because a competing affection is an idol and you shall not worship it. And Mordecai, he was expressing his faith. I'm not going to bow down to this king's official. And when he did that, it incited fury. His strong faith led to a plot to destroy the Jews because Mordecai would not worship Haman. He would not bow down to the king. <clears throat> Mordecai puts the whole nation at risk according to his principles. There was a plot then that followed, chapter 3, verse 13 and 14, and I'll read it for you if you don't mind. Chapter 3, 13 and 14. <clears throat> and letters were sent by couriers to the king's provinces with instructions to destroy, to kill, to annihilate all the Jews, young and old, women, children, 
in one day the 13th of the 12th month, which is the month of Adar, and to plunder their goods. A copy of this document was to be issued as a decree in every province as a proclamation to all the peoples to be ready for that day. 13th day, 12th month, uh, the Jews were to be annihilated, and Haman set this up with King Ahasuerus. So what have we got so far? We've got a king, he seems a little dull to me. King Ahasuerus, he's the king of Persia, no disrespect intended. He seems a little dull. He's a little dull and he, he's not sure about what's, so anyway, he's doing what people tell him. How many of you know that when you're doing what other people are telling you, unless those other people are highly respected and awfully spiritually deeply rooted in God, then you need to be careful how you listen to the advice of stupid people. Stupid gets what stupid recommends. And stupid people recommending stupid stuff is going to get you stupid outcomes. I'm against stupid outcomes. I don't have time for it. How many of you have time for stupid outcomes? Then don't listen to stupid people. The Word of God says that Haman is trying to kill them. All this is going on. Mordecai won't hear of it. And he stands up against it. And how beautiful. They're trying to destroy the Jews. Haman wants to kill them all. And all of this over a bitter feud really between him and one Jew who would not worship him. Isn't that just like we are? That we're so small. We get a little thing bother us. We just can't let it go. Can we? Can't seem to let it go. Well, you said, what do you mean? Well, look at uh, look at verse 13, chapter 5, Esther 5, 13. And this is uh, Haman's words. He had just recounted all of the blessings, all of his money, all of his concubines, all of the, all of the good things that he has. He's just been recounting those things um, from verses 9, chapter 5 and, and down. Then you get to verse 13. Yet all of this was worth nothing to me as long as I see Mordecai the Jew sitting at the king's gate. Wow, what a bitter man. All of these blessings from verse 9, he's talking about his wife. He's, he's talking about the splendor of his riches, verse 11. He's talking about all of his sons and the promotion, how he had been promoted uh, to, the king, to the king's office, how he had been advanced as one of the officials. And then he says, even Queen Esther has invited me to the dinner. And then verse 13. But nothing, it meant nothing. As long as Mordecai sits at the king's gate. See how bitterness does you? More, uh, Mordecai seated at, he is rebellious. He won't stay, he won't bow. And... Uh, Haman is so bitter, all of his blessings fog out in the depth of bitterness. This is what bitterness is going to do to you, by the way. Let it go. What are you holding on to that's worth holding on to that makes you miserable? Let it go. Haman could not let it go. And so he decides he's going to kill the Jews. Mordecai's response, high emotion, careful strategy. Mordecai's weeping. He is, uh, this is a tradition of the Jews, wearing torn clothing, putting ashes on his body, not bathing, not cutting his hair, not shaving. No, no, uh, he is mourning. And he's also strategizing because he gets the word over to Esther that Esther might save the day. So that's his strategy. I'm going to cry and grieve all I want. I'm going to try to get Esther, who is on the inside, to have a breakthrough for us. Thank God she does. Next, Esther becomes an unexpected instrument of providence. So chapter 4, all the way through chapter 7, verse 6, it really unfolds how Esther is used by God to, to save the Jews from death. Haman intends to kill all the Jews. What's the problem with that? If all the Jews are dead, there's no Messiah. Satan has been on attack mode toward the Messiah since the Garden of Eden, you know. 
One of, the, one of the things I think we could all as believers agree with is that except that God preserved the Messianic line, there would be, have been no Jesus. God dramatically preserved the Jewish people. And so why is it that Christian people generally have stood in solidarity with, with Israel? Not the nation necessarily, but true Israel. Why do we stand in solidarity with them? Because through the, through the true Israel came the Messiah, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus was a Jew. So we've got national Israel, which is a problem for me. We've got political Israel, which is a problem. I'm not talking about that. Now, I think often in our, in our politics, we're talking about national Israel. The Bible says national Israel is not the true Israel. Who is the true Israel? Those who believe by faith like Abraham did. How do I differentiate that? That's my problem. I can't. I can't tell. I can't tell who is national Israel, who is spiritual Israel. <clears throat> Hold another subject. We'll get to that in Romans chapter 9 through 11, particularly chapter 11. So Esther is recruited to save the day, isn't she? Recruited to save the day by Mordecai. Um, she says, I'm afraid that I'm going to be killed because the king, these ancient peoples, right, they're misogynistic by extreme, and so you couldn't even approach the king without permission or invitation. If you did, you could be killed. But Esther goes and she puts on her uh, beautiful robes and beautiful dresses and her cosmetics, and doubtless she is uh, quite the looker. And she, the king allows her a hearing. He grants her an entrance and she goes on then to say, can we have a banquet with you and with Haman? Haman is the, is the protagonist, the bad man. Can I have a dinner with you, king, and uh, with Haman? And uh, they make that arrangement. And so they do. They go to dinner. And that's what's happening in chapters, the end of four through seven. She becomes this unexpected instrument of providence and how wonderful God chose an orphan girl to do his great work. Listen to this passage and uh, I'll, I'll conclude with this. 1 Corinthians 1, 27 through 29, talking about a very simple orphan girl promoted. Who gets promoted? The ones whom the Lord promotes. That's who gets promoted. For consider your calling, brothers, not, that you, not many of you were wise according to worldly standard. Not many were powerful. Not many were noble of birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing the things that are so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. Verse 28, isn't that wonderful? God chose the low and the despised. He chose to use the knots to put to shame the R's. That's why you cannot look at another person and say to them, you are lesser than, because you come from modest means. You cannot look at another person and say, you are not as important as I am because you don't have an important job or a good education. You cannot look at another human and say, because my family pedigree is more prominent than yours, then you're lesser than. My goodness, look at what the Bible says. God on purpose chooses the lowly among us. He chooses the knots, not very important, not very famous, not very good looking, not very prominent, not very wealthy. God chooses the knots to put to shame the R's. Because God plus nothing is everything. Why is it that the knots are to be preferred over the R's? Because God plus nothing is everything. And everything minus God is nothing. Then praise God that people like orphan girls can be positioned in the king's palace to carry out the Lord's bidding and save the people. Esther becomes an important instrument of providence. 
God wins again. Last point. Chapter 7 through the end of the chapter. I asked you to read it. God wins again. God has a 100% batting average. I guess we should say 1,000 if we're talking about baseball. He never swings and misses. He never fails. His slugging percentage is perfection. Every time God sets his hand to do anything, it is successful. This is the rule and reign of our God. And good fortune does not come from the east to west, north to south. It comes from the hand of the good God who in his own providential way decides who to promote and who to humble. Therefore, if God decides who to promote and who to humble, wouldn't it be uh, pretty important that we be on the right side of our creator God? If we say that God has given us this wonderful promise that all things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Who gets that promise? Things working together for good. Who gets that? The ones who love God and the ones who are called according to his purpose. The others of us don't get that. You say, well, is God unfair in giving out his blessings? Are you unfair in distributing your blessings? We give each other the right to distribute our blessings, but we don't give the right to God to distribute his. Therefore, what must we do? Cry out to God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Christ, who died on the cross, made possible our recovery. Recovery of what? Everything broken. You don't, do you know how broken things are? Is your mind right? Is your body right? Do you anticipate living a right old age? How do you know you will? Do you know the day of your death? You didn't know the date of your birth. What of this God of yours? Why do you push him away? And wouldn't it be right of you to align yourself with the God who made you? Because he's promised. If you love him and are called for his purposes, things will work out for good. How about you might be that person of instrumentality in the provident flow of God's handiwork on the earth? It was Esther, wasn't it? Placed, prepared. She was a beauty when God decided to put her upon the earth. He planned it. Everything necessary was given to her. And then every circumstance was arranged for her. And then all the people necessary were aligned around her. And then the wisdom she needed was advanced to her from Mordecai. Oh God, how great you are to cause according to your will the affairs of my life so that I might enjoy your good favor as I humble myself and you lift me up and you're doing through me and you the will of God. Why do we resist? Because we are so afraid that following Jesus might cost us more than we want to pay. I remember that because I, I was saved as an adult. I was 21, right? I wasn't a kid. And I kept thinking, oh, if I, if I dedicate myself to Jesus, what's it going to mean for me? Is it going to cost me more than I want to pay? I was afraid, afraid, afraid of that for a long time. How about you? Are you afraid of that? Well, my testimony, 30-some years of it, is that whatever he asked me to pay, he provided that I might give it joyously. I'm not a man suffering I'm a man exalting and rejoicing because of my walk with Jesus Christ. I highly commend him to you. Believe on the name of the Lord Jesus. How do I get involved in this? How do I align myself with the flow of God's work on the earth? He made you already. Can we agree to that? Here you are. He made you already. He's speaking to your heart about believing in Jesus, who is God's choice of how we can have our sins forgiven. He's already done all of this. What about for you? What must you do? Believe. You say, but I don't, I don't know if I can believe. Do you believe? Believing is not some kind of weird experience. It is a determination of conscious awareness. I believe that Christ died for me. That's all that's required. 
What else need we to do to be saved? Believe on the name of the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. I pray that you will. Don't waste any more time arguing with God. Your arms are too short to box with God. Don't box with Him. Humble yourself before the mighty hand of God and He will lift you up. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we are a people of great need and our need is because we have a clear awareness of our problem. Our problem is that we're sinners, we're selfish, self-absorbed, only concerned with self. And yet we know deep inside of our consciousness that you're our God, you created us for greatness, for good, for, to do good, to love well, to worship you and to care for our neighbor, but we're not so faithful at that. I pray, oh God, that everyone listening would, would search their own hearts about whether they believe the gospel or not. Whether they, are, whether they live like Esther, whether they could step forward and do something dramatic. I pray, oh God, that for everyone here, if there's anyone that doesn't know you as their Savior, I pray that you would help them to know you and to cast their whole life upon you and to do so without regret because we trust that you will provide. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.